Hello, and welcome to Best in Tabletop Trophy Triumphs, the newest show on the Best in Tabletop Network, and one that will be solely available here on YouTube. So what is this show? Whenever someone from Best in Tabletop Network, at least at first, wins an event, we'll have an episode of BIT4, which is this show, for those of you who don't like repeatedly saying tongue twisters, to interview those people. The goal of this show is to talk about the preparation and planning that led up to the event. We have a lot of other shows that will discuss what happened and how that fits into a larger narrative. What we want to do here is learn about the people and the process they took to get to a list that they felt confident in. How's this show going to work? We're, there's going to be two halves that are really two parts because they're not co-equal. There'll be a 10-minute introduction where we lay out at a high level our understanding of what armies the players brought and why they brought that army. This first bite is free for everyone. Afterwards, there'll be 45 to 15 minutes for us to dive deep into the player's understanding of their faction, current state of the meta, their read on specific considerations for the event they were going to, their starting point on list building, what their testing plan was, any surprises they had, any expectations they were met, and finally, where they ended up and what their plan was going into that event. That part will be behind the YouTube paywall. So who am I? My name is Billy Heilman. I've variously been a teacher, a lawyer, and now I actually sell wind turbines. I live in San Francisco, California with my wife and the semi-official pig of the Best in Table Top Discord, Lilu. Uh, you can find out more about her by asking. What are my 40K bona fides? Why am I the person hosting this show? Well, I've been playing on and off since the start of second edition, which basically just means that I'm old. Um, and I do act as a tournament organizer here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've been focused on competitive play since about mid to late eighth edition, basically a few months before Yanari were put in the ground. That said, I have absolutely no meaningful results to speak of in competitive 40K. So why am I hosting this show? It's based mainly on my ability to ask questions and to lead a conversation that can bring out the, um, the ideas of the players as much as my personal expertise in winning 40K. My goal is to learn as much as the audience does, both about the people who've won and the process they came to in creating their list and prepping for the tournament. So who are we here to talk to today? We have Colin Sherman and Hank Adams. Colin, you know, he's the creative director of Best in Tabletop Network. He's the host of Biff Pod. He's the creator of Charity Hammer. He's a lover of elves and nids, but we won't hold that against him. Um, is there anything you want to add about yourself, Colin, that I missed? I want to interrupt first and and uh, have the creative director call and visit for just a moment uh, on this first wonderful new show for the Best in Tabletop Network and say that uh, Billy was the second name we came up with. And I only admit to that because he was in the conversation before the first name was, was talked about. But Billy is the sort of person that really cares about questions. And when I say that, I think that a lot of people aren't good at listening to the answer of the question and asking, asking another question. When you when Billy wants to learn something from you, you feel very like very much like he's connected, he's paying attention, he really wants to understand. That plus the fact that Billy likes everything we've ever made, or at least that's what he says, okay. make, make Billy a great choice uh, for this role. And we're, we're nothing but happy to have him here. And for the rest of the episode, I will not be creative director Colin, and I will be Colin who went to a tournament and sometimes hosts a podcast. Thank you for those kind words, Colin. Um, and as I said, we all know Colin. The person we might not know as well, who has this awesome avatar of an avatar, is Hank Adams. Uh, I know Hank from the Best in Tabletop Discord, where his standouts are his atypical feelings towards Star Wars and land trains. And I've personally really enjoyed watching him on the Battle of Generations pilot Craftworld Eldar. Um, but I'll admit, I actually don't know Hank much beyond that. So Hank, you want to tell us about yourself for a little bit here? Uh yeah sure um like I said my name my name's Hank Adams uh I am a middle school history teacher um I am uh, pretty much I've, I've professionally just been a, an educator in public schools in uh, both Louisiana and Washington State for about the past seven or eight years um I have been playing competitive tabletop games since the end of second edition 40k and i've jumped around to a bunch of different games i played war machine and hordes for a long time um i dive pretty deeply into the competitive scene of marvel crisis protocol and also i've been 
pretty deep into competitive 40k from about third edition through the end of fifth and then i got back in right in the middle of this, and that takes me up to the present well thank you for that and it turns out hank you and i have very similar times when we've paid attention and not paid attention to 40k <laughs> there you go um, so well that's a little bit about the two lesser known of us uh let's just jump right in and so for this introductory section we're going to talk broad based about how their weekend went more in the preparation for it than the actual event and in this case we have colin and hank who both took craft world eldar to tau tipping in western washington eastern washington i don't know western washington. Washington, over over on the peninsula okay um it was uh ma major yes there was a it was there was 40 gt so, majorish 40, 40 40 something people before drop before yeah. some people dropped during the event so mm -hmm. it, an event where they planned on going up against some of the best people in the Pacific Northwest. And you That's guys accurate. both brought Craft World Eldar into a world where everyone thinks Harlequins are the good half of that book. Why did you guys decide to do that? Uh, well, first of all, I think, Hank, bo bo both of us didn't actually like how Harlequins played when we saw them on the table, right? Like yeah, that that. That's pretty much um, my take on it. I was just like, oh, cool. Uh, it's it's another book like Custodes where I don't really have to think to do anything. It's basically, I put my models on the table. My stats are amazing. My rules are great. And if you just can't kill it, I win. Uh, and also, I just, I decided to bring Craft World Eldar because I like Craft World Eldar. And I wanted to see if I could make it. Yeah. That's the beginning, middle, and end for me. Yeah, and the reason that uh, Hank and I are here together is because this was a project we really did together. Oh, yeah. uh, we we I mean we went deep. Uh, we played mm -hmm. we played dozens of games with different armies and different things and different that and like and talked and talked and talked and worked and worked and worked because in the end I'm not a Harlequin player never have been. I'm literally wearing the appropriate shirt. <laughs> I okay. fire dragon is it? My, eh, whatever you want or dire <laughs> <laughs> Um. So I, I Eldar is, is by far my favorite faction. It's the faction I perform the best with. I tend to play it the best. And when Hank and I thought we saw a route that gave us a list that could have a game into Harlequins, the idea of going to a tournament that everyone presumes will be won by Harlequins and and winning the tournament and beating Harlequins with the path that nobody's talking about of the book, not nobody, but a lot less people yeah. are talking about, uh, it was just too appealing. And then and then in the test games, we were putting models on the table that like are our favorite thing. Mm -hmm. Shining spears and warp spiders. Spiders. And Fire prisons. Yeah, fire prisons. Yeah. Like just and like like just like cool stuff. Like I've got Eldrad on the table for the first time in three years. Like I've got I it's just it my wave serpent that's made out of a turtle. Like it, that part of it was mm -hmm. very exciting as well. Oh yeah. So so it was the combination of the play style of Harlequins not being what's necessarily up your alley and seeing a path with Craft World both to play the models you love, but also seemingly them having the right set of tools to answer this meta um, at the risk of making a chainsword joke. They were the actual chainsword that you saw in this case. <laughs> I think I, Go ahead. Oh yeah, I, I think that uh, one of the great parts about the Craft World Eldar book is unlike the Harlequin side of it that only has like, what, eight data sheets? Mm -hmm. The Craft World Eldar book is incredibly deep with mm -hmm. loads and loads and loads of tools that will allow you to answer very disparate meta states uh -huh. and okay. that is my favorite type of book to play i want to play codex toolbox and that's uh -huh. to my mind what crap worlds are also both hank and i uh we both need to use intel our our brains to win 40k it's important to both of us we'll get bored otherwise Agreed. and there's a there's a great deal of reward in the mm -hmm. in the craft world elder portion of the book for intelligent play I don't want to even remotely start talking skill floors and skill walls and ceilings and elevators that have skill on them. Like it's all very confusing to me. But the 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 reality is the Craft World Elder book is hard to play. Um, yeah. It's significantly harder to play than Harlequins. It's much harder to play than Custodes. Yes. I believe it's harder to play than Tau. So if you're comparing it to the other things that are competitive, I think it's by far the hardest one. Um, and that's very appealing to me. Uh, because mm -hmm. I love my opponent not knowing what I'm going to do with the table. I, yeah. The easiest people for me to beat are the people whose armies are telegraphed, death guards, yes. custodes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where you sit down and you go, well, it's obvious what you're doing. I'll just do something that stops that. Fine. Yeah. Let's go home. Like, yeah. 
I, which makes a ton of sense. Um, I, I also am holding an avatar here on my desk because I love it. So I, I share a lot of these perspectives. Um, I th think one of the things that what you guys just said about the optionality in the book and that it's hard to play definitely resonates. And it raises a question for me of, I think it's also hard to read the book and see where the power is yeah. on the craft world side. And Agreed. I want to just tease the audience that that's as much as anything what I want to dive into in the second half is try to see what your guys' process was for figuring out that interlocking set of puzzle pieces. And I ask as a guest, uh, but we're going through a list in the first half, in the first part? Um, yes, we're going through a list in the let, let's, let's, um, let's ask a few more questions. End on where your list was. That's a great end point for the first half. Cool. And then we can find out more about that yeah. um, when they decide to financially reward Wonderful. the best in table. Whatever you want, it's your show. Um, so but you would agree that like the the puzzle of what the army should be is at least as if not more complicated than on the table itself or is that my misconception what do you think Hank? i think that there are a lot of tools in that book and you have to know what combination of tools you want to bring because Certain tools in the Craft World Eldar book give you certain sets of strengths, but they also mm -hmm. open up different types of weaknesses. And you have to bring the right combinations of units to cover up the weaknesses that your list construction opens up. If that is a little bit too esoteric, basically, no. okay, yeah, certain yeah, puzzle, please. certain puzzle pieces in the in the book uh, cover the gaps of each other better mm -hmm. than other combinations will. And I feel like figuring out how the table is going to unfold and what questions you're going to be able to answer and what ones you can't answer is going to inform what you need to bring in your list. Mm -hmm. And that is excellently teeing up several of the questions that I'm going to ask in the second part. We've gotten about to the point where let's run through your guys' list. Was it the same list point for point or were there slight uh, I think I think it's probably easiest. I'll go through my list and then Hank can mm -hmm. tell you what's different. It won't take okay. very long for Hank's part won't take very long. Fair enough. Uh, so Colin, I, I am actually going to look at it on the screen because I don't want to mess it up. It is a double patrol, and it has it's all Oathway. Uh, lots of lots of argument there about what's best, but Oathway is very straightforward. I take Eldrad, I take a Farseer Skyrunner, and I take Baharat. Those are my three HQs. Um, I take the helm on the Farseer to make mm -hmm. it so that I have six powers over two Farseers, basically between Eldrad and the and the helm guy. Eldrad has three casts with three rolls. Uh, and then the guy on the the guy on the Skyrunner has Ghost Walk, which I only need sometimes. And so uh, sometimes I'd use Ghost Walk instead of Doom or Will of Askergen. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's that's what he does. And then I have two units of Rangers. I have a unit of Pen Dire Avengers that usually get outflanked uh, if mm -hmm. there's any indirect fire. I like dropping them in and doing and doing an action if I need to and shooting someone. Let me uh, ask I you a quick question there: Webway yeah. or outflank? Is there Depend two separate? It depends on whether I fanta when the, whether I'm fantasizing them, which is usually what happens for me. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I usually, basically, all, other than the warp spiders, all of my deep striking is usually as a response to yeah, phantasm so. because I deploy to go first and then let them go into deep strike after that. Um, and then I have a warlock sky runner. Uh, we like to give him the the sunstorm because he casts one power in my list. He it's the plus one to wound power. Mm. He casts one power. Usually I'm smiting with him, but I like the turn where he goes 26 inches and has OPSEC and steals an objective before dying. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. I have five Shining Spears uh, with the plus one to hit on the charge and the up spear upgrade because I really value being strength eight on the leader. I also mm -hmm. rocked the Shuriken Cannon upgrade that that's randomly true. exists for the leader of the of that unit now that never existed before. It's and it's free. Cost. Yeah, and it's free. <laughs> yeah, because I was like, well, but four shots is better than three. Oh, but it's the Shuriken Cannon, which is like one of the best guns in the game. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And then uh, I have the five of uh, Warp Spiders with the six guns, and I do the thing where they get plus one shot, so it's okay. 66 plus six shots when they come in. Um, they deep strike for free. Mm -hmm. Things that deep strike for free and also do damage are a really big deal in this game, especially in shooting. So that's mm -hmm. really great. Then I have two units of Shadow Weavers. I have two Fire Prism, or yeah, Fire Prisms, with both with Vectored Engines, mm -hmm. big part of the list. And let's see what I'm forgetting. But two fives of Howling Banshees, one that does the two different mortal things on the way in, mm -hmm. one that has the two damage uh, per attack, both with mirror swords. And that is my list. And if Hank's wave list serpent. is different in what way? You forgot the wave serpent. Colin. Yeah. Oh, yes. And I have the wave serpent yep. with just 
Bare Bones Wave Serpent, it used to have double bright lights on it, but you know what? I like double shuriken cannon better, and it's cheaper. Mm. <laughs> We'll, yeah, we'll definitely have that conversation because I'm curious there. Hank, what, what's different about yours? Okay, my list is uh, almost exactly the same as Colin's, except I'm not running Eldred. And oh. in so I, I, I gained 50 points back by running a foot Farseer over Eldred. Mm-hmm. And uh, I dropped the um, 145 point units of uh, Warp Spiders. And in the place of those, I run a 10 man unit of Swooping Hawks. With the uh, warlock, uh, sorry, the um, uh, exarch upgrade to have them mm. be minus one to hit. They also have the relic that gives the entire unit a, f- a five up, you no pain. Uh, and I think I have like one less set of vectored engines on one of my wave servants. All right, sorry, yeah, fire versions. So and that's yeah. that's literally the only difference. <laughs> yep. Okay, th- th- that's actually a fascinating difference, and I'm not just saying that because I want you to stick around for the paid mm-hmm. part of this. Um, <laughs> it's fascinating both because it's one of the best ways to trigger our fellow hosts of Fight Club, and because I think it's really interesting. So right now we're going to take a break, go to part two, and hopefully see a lot more of you there so we can really dig into not just what Colin and Hank ran, but their process for getting there, which I Let think me, uh... is- let me help you out with how people are going to find that. Uh, this video is on the YouTube. It's where you're watching it. There's a button down below that says join. That takes you to our members only area. It is $10 a month and it gets you a bunch of different content. It gets you part two of these. Every time someone from the network wins a GT or greater event, we will do a shorter part one event like you just saw. We'll do a longer part two where we go real nerdy and we go real deep and we have a good time. That's going to be next. That's you'll find that in that area. Also, there's a second kind of after hour after party for Fight Club each week that you can only get in that place. Also, there's a whole bunch of battle reports that are shortened, uh, have commentary over them, telestration over the screen, so you know exactly what's happening. Lots of those are there free for everybody. Many of them are behind that in that members only area as well. And finally, I do a show called Chasing the Narrative. Uh, it's interviews with 40k meta people. Uh, where I don't talk about 40k and I just learn about them. It's amazing and wonderful and one of my favorite things ever. Part two is behind, is in that members area as well. And that's where I, things get weird and I make, like, for example, I had Chuck talk for 15 minutes about being only evil characters in live action role play. So join us there. Uh, you can cancel any time. It's $10 a month. There you go. See you guys shortly. We'll be right back.